All right, guys, here we go with the first chapter. It is called Luther. Marty O'Hara did not realize how much he had missed his best friend, Luther Smith, until Luther jumped out of the seaplane onto the dock at Kryptos Island. In fact, he was so excited to see Luther, he didn't even notice the other rather odd-looking passenger who had flown in with his gangly, fluorescent, carrot-headed classmate. The lanky Luther ran up to Marty, sporting his trademark goofy grin and a small backpack slung over his bony shoulder. You weren't lying, nose picker, Luther said. Kryptos Island is real and very weird. Marty returned to Luther's grin. Duh, du jour, he said, meaning duh of the day one of his and Luther's favorite sayings. Just then, almost as if the accent, Marty's point, a chimpanzee enabled, I'm sorry, ambled down the wooden dock, came to an abrupt stop directly in front of Luther and hooted. This is Bo, Marty said, and you're the nose picker. Luther ignored the insult and squatted down in front of Bo before Marty could warn him. Bo grabbed a handful of Luther's bizarre hair and yanked it out. Ouch! Luther fell over backward and would have fallen into the water if Marty hadn't grabbed his arm. Thanks, Luther said. No problem, Marty said. Bo hooted again, ran back up the dock with her treasure, scaled the chain link security gate, and disappeared into the trees. Okay, so right now we have three people. We have Marty, Luther, and Bo. Okay. And from what we understand, uh, Marty, Mrs. Luther, and then we have this silly chimpanzee who comes into the picture and starts pulling some hair. Hair picker, Luther yelled after her. Marty shook his head. I wonder what she was doing. Going to think of your hair. Luther rubbed his sore scalp. I guess she doesn't like it. Wrong, Marty corrected. She wants it. How much did she take? Marty looked at his friend's head. A pretty good chunk, but no one will notice. Luther's hair had always stuck up all over the place in one giant colic that not even Elmer's glue could keep down. Luther had actually tried Elmer's glue once, but it had just made things worse. The missing hair already forgotten, Luther looked over at the giant ship moored to the dock. So that's the Kolenkonkth, he said, pronouncing the name Kolyonkonkth. He pronounced Silakonkth. You dunce, Marty said, named after a fish thought to have gone extinct 65 million years ago until it was rediscovered in South Africa by a woman named Marjorie Cornery Latmer in 1938. Wolf has a breeding pair in an aquarium up in the library. Well, that ship looks like it's 65 million years old, Luther said. You sure that rusty bucket of bolts can make it to New Zealand? It'll make it, Marty said, not mentioning the scuttlebutt on the island that the Hong Kong was haunted, badly haunted. The ship had drifted into U.S. coastal waters 10 years earlier, minus its cargo, and its crew of nearly 50 men and women, except for the captain's freshly severed head lying on the pillow on its berth. Grace had gotten this information off the internet, but there was no point in scaring Luther by recounting the ship's grisly history. Marty's uncle, Travis Wolf, had brought the ship had bought the ship at an auction for a fraction of what it was worth because he was the only bidder. No one else wanted to touch the bad luck ship. The ridiculous superstition was my good luck, Wolf had explained. I had enough money left over to retort the interior. That's a good word. Retrofit. I'm sorry. Retort. Retrofit. Okay. Clearly, Wolf was not concerned with what it looked like on the outside. Colin Cloth was buzzing with activity, people hauling gear, cranes, lowering crates into the cargo holds, deckhands battering down a helicopter to a landing pad behind the bridge. Marty was certain that none of them had heard the story of what had happened on the ship, and he had wished that he'd never heard it either. 
We're shipping out in a couple of weeks, Luther said. Maybe sooner, Marty said. People have been coming in by airplane, chopper, and boat every day for the past week. They go right onto the ship. Wolf hasn't let any of them onto the island for security reasons. Yeah, Luther said, pointing. Like that guy walking up the gangplank. He came in on the seaplane with me. His name is Dr. Seth A. Leopold. Barely said a word during the whole flight. I pegged him as a squid scientist. He has longer legs and arms than I do and smells like a dead fish. Even Phil was put off by the stench. He kept looking back at the guy, wondering what the problem was. Phil was Phil Bishop, a retired Air Force colonel and one of Travis Wolf's pilots. He was married to Bertha Bishop, a retired Army Ranger General, with the ability to kill someone 106 ways with her bare hands. She was now Wolf's chief cook and mother to Phil's bishop, a.k.a. Phil Jr., another retired Air Force veteran and Wolf's chief pilot. Have the Mulky Mormon gangs hatched? Luther asked. Not yet, Marty answered, but Wolf expects them to start cracking any day now. I can't believe you guys saw an actual living dinosaur in the Congo. Are you sure the eggs are real? Luther said. As real as Bo yanking your hair from your scalp, Marty answered. Let's head up to the fort. Fort? Luther asked. You'll see. I'd better get the rest of my gear. Luther started toward the seaplane, but Marty stopped him. Don't bother. Phil will have someone haul it up and put it in your room after they search it. Search it, Luther said. Marty nodded. After what happened in the Congo, Wolf hardened island security. About a week ago, a guy named Albert Ikes took over island security. He used to work for the Central Intelligence Agency, and he's a complete paranoid nutcase. I don't think he even trusts Wolf, and Wolf is his boss. At least I think he is. Is this Albert Ikes guy going to New Zealand with us? Luther asked. Unfortunately, Marty said, and don't call him Albert. Call him Al, or he might shoot you. Come on. Oh, and he stopped and handed Luther a silver chain with a square piece of carrot-colored plastic hanging from it. This is a tracking tag you wrote me about, Luther said. Yeah, but these tags are new and improved, Marty explained, pointing to the gray plastic square hanging from the chain around his neck. Put it on and don't even take it off, even when you're in the shower. Don't ask me how, but they know when you're wearing it and when you're not. The second day I had mine, I took it off in my sleep because I got tangled around my neck and I thought I was choking me to death. Within minutes, two of Al's stormtroopers burst into my bedroom with guns drawn. I almost had a heart attack. Luther slipped the chain over his head and tucked the square underneath his shirt, his sweatshirt. You're not joking about any of this. No joke, Marty said. Why all the security? Marty counted the reasons on his fingers. Noah Blackwood, Milk and Bum Eggs, Ted Bronson's top secret work for the government, and Grace. Grace, what does your sister, I mean your cousin, have to do with all this? Marty started walking down the dock. I'll tell you all about it after we get through the metal detector. Metal detector? Luther asked. Marty pointed to the end of the dock where two armed security men were guarding the chain link gate. They wore camouflage, fatigues, and deadly serious expressions. The guys with the shaved heads are a couple of Al stormtroopers who are actually ex-Navy SEALs. They pretty much stick to the perimeter of the island, watching the intruders, except at the fort, where Al and two guys on station 24-7. Once we get past them, everything on the island is a lot more relaxed. I email because you didn't want anyone on the outside to know about the new security measures. Marty and Luther walked up to the two bullet-headed men. Empty your pockets and turn them inside out. You know the drill. Bullethead number one said, slapping a plastic tray on the stainless steel table. I already did, Marty said. I left all my stuff here with you so I don't have to be searched again, remember? Turn your pockets inside out anyways, bullethead number two said. Marty turned his empty pockets inside out again. Bullethead number one frisked him, making sure he hadn't slipped a nuclear device into his undershorts while they weren't looking. Then had Marty pass through the metal detector. You're next, bullethead number two said, glaring at Luther. You asked for it, Luther said, revealing his first pocket of half a dozen colored pencils, a pencil sharpener, candy wrappers, a small sketch pad, a pair of sunglasses, a comb, 
unless in Luther's case. A handheld video game player, two flash drives, a digital camera, stereo earbuds, a stick of gum, an iPhone, and dental floss. I started with the easy pocket first, he said, then began emptying the second pocket. The bullet head rolled his eyes as they watched the mounds of stuff grow. Did you cram everything in your own everything you own into your pockets, Marty asked. Nah, Luther answered. The big stuff is down at the at the dock. Three humongous suitcases. I didn't know what to expect. So I brought everything I had at Omega Prep except my bed. I could have gotten everything into two suitcases, but I needed a third for those diaries Grace asked me to bring back for her. Moleskines? Moleskines? Moleskines. Moleskines. Moleskines, Marty said. 315 of them. Grace had kept a diary ever since she had learned how to write at the age of five. Yeah, Luther said. That suitcase weighs about a thousand pounds. The valuable gear in here is in the backpack. Didn't want to risk losing it if they lost my luggage at the airport. Phil could hardly squeeze the suitcases in with all of the junk Dr. Fish Stink brought along. That's a silly name. He nodded at the at the bullet heads. These guys are lucky they aren't checking this stuff. It smelled worse than he did. Bouquet of Roquel. One whiff of that and these two security guards would be retching. That's a good word. Retching. What does that mean? Right. We are not security guards, bullet head number one muttered. Don't mean to offend you, Luther said cheerfully. Marty had forgotten how pleasantly annoying Luther could be when someone was annoying him. Cryptos was going to be much more fun with Luther around. We are security specialists, bullet head number two said. Sorry, Luther said. You act like security guards, and I just thought... He turned his last pocket inside out. That does it for the pockets. He held his arms out from his sides. I'm ready for the pat down, but I have to warn you. I'm a little ticklish. Oh, and I have this rash that's highly contagious. The doctors don't know what it is or how to get rid of it. Bullet head number two snapped on a pair of disposable rubber gloves and frisked Luther more roughly than he had Marty. Luther giggled through the entire process. What's on the flash drives? Bullet head number one asked. Stuff, Luther said. Well, examine the stuff and, and give the drives back to you. Maybe. We'll keep the camera on the video game player too. And the cell phone, bullet head number two added. I need the iPhone, Luther said. My parents are going to be calling. I don't think they'll be happy with you if you took it away. Luther's parents were billionaires and barely knew they had a son. Marty had never even met them, and he'd known Luther since they attended first grade together at the Omega Opportunity Preparatory School in Switzerland. He doubted Luther's parents would be calling. It's the rules, bullethead number one said. You got a problem with the rules? You could take it up with Mr. Ikes or Dr. Wolf. Don't worry about it, Marty said. You can use my gizmo to call my parents or to have them have them call you. You mean I don't get my own gizmo? Luther asked disappointed. Afraid not, Marty said. Only a few people have them. Grace doesn't have one either. Al decided to limit the units for security reasons. To make a call out or get in, we'll have to get his or Wolf's permission. Why did they give you a gizmo, Luther asked. Marty looked at the guards. I'll tell you later. You won't believe the improvements Ted Bosman had made on them. Ted Brownsman was Wolf's partner in eWolf, a software development and, tech and technology company. <clears throat> Marty had never laid eyes on Ted, but not the lack of trying. It was rumored that the eccentric genius hadn't stepped out of Conquest Hut, where Luther... Uh, oh, I'm sorry... Uh, he hadn't stepped out of Conquest Hunt, where he invented things in more than three years. Centric. That's a great word to know as well. Luther reached for his pack. That says, that stays here, bullethead number one said. We'll give it back to you after we've had a chance to examine the contents. When, Luther asked. That's hard to say, bullethead number two said. We're kind of backed up. Luther looked at the abandoned dock. Phil had already taken off in the seaplane to pick up more people from the mainland. I can see that, Luther said. Let me just take one thing with me. It never leaves my side. If I can't take it, then I just have to wait here with you until you're done. 
Let's see what it is. Bullethead number one said, clearly not happy about the prospect of spending another minute with Luther Smith. Close your eyes, Luther told Marty. Why? Because there's a present for you and Grace, you dunes. Marty closed his eyes and heard pages being turned. This is just a bunch of shh, Luther said. Do you want to wreck the surprise? Just take it with you and get out of here, bullethead number one said. Marty opened his eyes and saw that whatever Luther had taken out of his pack was now stuffed under his sweatshirt. They walked through the gate and over to a beat-up four-wheeler. Marty strapped on a helmet and swung onto the front. Luther did the same and, and climbed on behind him. While Marty tried to get the four-wheeler started, Luther turned around and shouted at the bullet heads. I wasn't kidding about the rash. The last doctor who looked at it was infected within an hour, and he still has it. He was wearing gloves, too. I'm really sorry. The four-wheeler belched to life, and Marty peeled out.